the um, the all-knowing, the all-wise, and there is no uh, strength or power except uh, with you, and indeed you are uh, the uh, exalted, uh, the Almighty. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, all praise be to Allah, because uh, it is uh, by the grace and mercy of Allah that I'm able to uh, be here tonight, this evening, to fulfill uh, the request by Triple uh, IT uh, of uh, Malaysia. Uh, for the last several months, they have been uh, requesting me to uh, uh, to uh, to start some kind of a course or program on Triple uh, IT uh, online, uh, which has been uh, hosting great scholars uh, before me such as uh, Professor, uh, Professor Anis Ahmed uh, and, and several others. I am very honored to be invited uh, by Triple IT and uh, also by my uh, younger colleagues in IIUM who will inshallah continue uh, the struggle to maintain the mission of uh, the original mission uh, of IIUM, the raison d'etre of uh, the existence of uh, IIUM insha'Allah. Uh, so thank you very much uh, Prof. Aslam and also Prof. Fauzan, uh, Brother Shukran from Triple IT uh, for hosting me uh, tonight and uh, insha'Allah uh, seven other uh, um, Friday evenings insha'Allah uh, from today. Uh, I shall also be um, speaking uh, in the uh, seven series uh, course on the Hamka, uh, focusing on the spiritual uh, aspects of his thoughts. Uh, and um, I, um, uh, you may be wondering why at this stage I am, uh, um, you know, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, to recall uh, the thoughts of, uh, of Buya Hamka uh, I am, uh, alhamdulillah, 78. Uh, I exceed Buya Hamka by five years. Uh, he died at 73. Uh, but what a rich life of uh, complete dedication uh, to the cause of Islam or the reforming spirit of, of Islam uh, in Indonesia and the Malay world in general. Now, uh, uh, let me give you uh, some of the reasons why I decided to, to speak uh, on the, or about uh, Buya Hamka, although I am not the most knowledgeable uh, in Malaysia. There are many other people, many other scholars, uh, many other intellectuals in Malaysia uh, who are more knowledgeable about Buya Hamka. Uh, of course, in Indonesia, uh, where he uh, was born and where he died, you have uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, scholars and intellectuals who know much more about him and can speak with greater authority. Uh, the only justification for me to speak about Buya Hamka is because uh, in my school days, I, I, I heard about his book, uh, Ayahku, uh, that was about 1956, 57. I, I, but I did not read that book, um, but I came to know that uh, the book Ayahku was there. And then later on, I came, I came to know about his novel, Tenggelamnya Kapal Thunder Big, uh, and then Di Bawah Lindungan Kaaba. Uh, and then, to, then I had the opportunity uh, to meet him in person uh, a couple of times in Jakarta in, at his house in Kebayoran um, uh, in 1973. Uh, I, um, I interviewed him about the uh, contemporary situation, intellectual situation in Indonesia, and I visited uh, almost daily the office of Panji Masyarakat uh, at uh, Masjid uh, Al-Azhar in uh, Kebayoran. And of course, I was entertained by his, uh, by his son, uh, Almarhum uh, Bang Rushdi, uh, who uh, was most generous uh, with, um, with, with, with his time and also uh, gave me uh, many uh, publications of Panji Masyarakat. Uh, which I uh, used in, in, uh, to understand more about the uh, situation, the intellectual situation in Indonesia. Uh, so I was privileged to, to, to meet uh, Buya Hamka 
at his house and he was always very kind, very generous, very fatherly and uh, always smiling. And um, uh, then I listened several, to several of his TV uh, talks, uh, usually uh, Thursday evenings, there would be, uh, you know, uh, a program on, on TVRE uh, and uh, he would be speaking um, about uh, Islam in his uh, very unique way with his beautiful and eloquent uh, speech and also his uh, personality, his captivating personality. Uh, and, and I was informed uh, in, in those days that uh, there were people who converted to Islam after listening to him on, on television. Um, then uh, it was again my good fortune uh, to meet uh, Buya Hamka this time in Malaysia, in East Malaysia, in 1976. Maybe this is after he went to Singapore and then went to uh, Sarawak from Singapore, perhaps. So I was put on a panel with Buya Hamka uh, in the mosque, uh, in, in uh, the, the uh, Masjid uh, Besar uh, in, uh, in Sarawak. And uh, I told the audience that this is... Uh, this is a, a rare privilege of a, of a pupil uh, being allowed to sit next to his guru uh, and his father. And I should not actually be put on the same level with my guru and my father, uh, Buya Hamka, but uh, he was always magnanimous and would even allow this uh, young fellow uh, to, 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 seek, uh, to speak uh, uh, in his presence. Anyway, um, uh, then, of course, um, uh, I also had a chance to, uh, to read his, um, his um, uh, one of the earliest works, uh, that is uh, Tasawuf Modern, which uh, was completed in 1938. Uh, and um, I have a special inclination towards Tasawuf. Um, and uh, so I, I, I read that and I had one of my PhD students, now uh, Dr. Aziza uh, Ahmad, uh, to also uh, make a commentary and translation of the South Modern. Alhamdulillah, she did a good job and hopefully uh, she'll be able to publish uh, this PhD thesis, inshallah, in due time. Uh, the other reason that, um, uh, or justification for me to speak at this age because there are other people who can talk much better uh, about him. For instance, in Singapore, we have our great uh, uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Sayyid Khairuddin Al-Junaid, uh, who came out with this book, um, um, Hamka and Islam. Uh, Cosmopolitan Reform uh, in the Malay World. Uh, this is an excellent uh, work written by uh, Khairuddin Al-Junaid. He spent many years studying the works of uh, Buya Hamka and met him. And, uh, and uh, this is a wonderful uh, contribution uh, to the uh, knowledge about uh, our, our great uh, scholar. Now, uh, what attracted me uh, to Buya Hamka is his uh, exceptional uh, qualities. Uh, it, it's, it's really very rare in the modern world. In, in ancient times, in classical times, we had scholars who were polymaths. Uh, they, they were masters of different disciplines and they produced hundreds of, uh, of, of uh, treatises and, and uh, writings. But in the 20th century, uh, we had uh, someone in the Malay world who was a polymath. Uh, uh, until today, there is no... Uh, no equal uh, to Buya Hamka. Can you imagine you have um, uh, an Islamic uh, religious scholar who is uh, following the reformist tradition of Islam and Tajdid, um, and uh, um, uh, and then who came out with his monumental 30-volume um, Tafsir al-Azhar, which is one of the best. Uh, 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 Quranic commentaries in, in the Malay world. Um, and, um, uh, and at the same time, uh, this uh, religious scholar and uh, 
Quranic uh, exegetes, uh, is also a novelist. Uh, he came out not with one novel, not with just uh, Tenggelamnya Kapal Van Der Beek, but uh, 13, if not 15, novels, beginning with uh, C. Sabaria, uh, and then uh, and many, many more uh, novels. Uh, and he was good uh, in his work, although um, the communist uh, literary movement was trying to uh, undermine his popularity and, and uh, uh, alleging that he was a, a, a plagiarist. Uh, all those uh, um, allegations were actually uh, und, uh, unproven or uh, are baseless. Uh, anyway, so uh, you have uh, a Quranic scholar and uh, commentator with a monumental work and with uh, also a, a novelist. Uh, of course, he's also uh, um, an expert on, on uh, Minangkabau culture, Minangkabau art, and, and also Minangkabau tradition, like Kaba, for instance, these are stories uh, being read, uh, and uh, he, he, he mastered that. And he was also uh, an exponent of Silat. Uh, this is a Malay art of self-defense. Uh, I guess because of his uh, um, his mastery of Silat that he was made also the commander of the resistance movement uh, when the, the, the Dutch forces uh, came back uh, in, in, in Sumatra. Um, then uh, he wrote uh, he wrote on, of course, philosophy um, and um, uh, he wrote on history, Islamic history. I think he has six books on Islamic history. And I remember I had, I bought this uh, uh, Sejarah Umat Islam, uh, I think it's about 1,000 pages. <laughs> when did he have the time to write all this? Uh, and that's history. And he's one of those uh, historians who uh, countered the uh, Orientalist um, view that Islam came uh, to this part of the world, to Indonesia in the, uh, in the uh, 13th century, or maybe some of them 17th century. And he was the one who said that Islam was brought to this part of the world in the first uh, century itself uh, by the Arab uh, travelers uh, who dropped by uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in Aceh on the way to China. Uh, then um, he also uh, wrote um, books on, um, on uh, what... Um, uh, well, uh, a few books on, on Islamic political thought, on the Nagara Islam and politics, because he also became uh, a, 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 a political leader, not a politician as such, but a political leader, because as a, mem as a leader of Muhammadiyah and as a member of Mashumi party uh, uh, during the gen first general elections in 1955, uh, he was uh, the, the candidate uh, who won a seat on the on the uh, cons uh, on the uh, provisional uh, uh, assembly um, or the provisional parliament uh, of the Indonesian Republic? Uh, so he he wrote on 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 Nagara uh, and Islam, so that makes him in a way a, a political scientist of sorts. Uh, then, the, um, uh, of course, he has. Um, uh, he had also many uh, poems. Uh, he was well versed in, in poetry, and and when he would meet uh, some of his um, uh, some of his contemporaries from Minangkabau, then they would be exchanging poems uh, spontaneously uh, without any preparation. So that makes him uh, a, a poet of, of high quality. Um, and, and can you imagine that he did all this um, and he came out with, uh, uh, according to Dr. Khairuddin uh, Al-Junaid, uh, with 113 works. Uh, this, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, another uh, record in the uh, 20th century. But of course, in the old days, we have great scholars who came up with 100, 200 treatises and so on. And they spend all their life, day and night, uh, writing uh, religious treatises and, and died uh, young, uh, despite all that. Um, 
So, so I was fascinated by this uh, rare quality of, uh, of a, a Malay uh, Indonesian uh, religious uh, reformist uh, having all these qualities, despite the fact that he did not have um, more than six years of formal education in the primary school. After that, it was all by uh, uh, self-learning, uh, autodidactic way of, of, of getting knowledge. Uh, and so um, uh, I would like, um, this is uh, the main motivation, I would like the younger generation of, uh, of Malays, Malays in, in general in Malaysia, and also Malaysian, even non-Muslims, of course, the, uh, the Indonesian younger generation, our, our brothers and sisters over there uh, can always, um, you know, um, uh, uh, revitalize the legacy of, uh, of Buya Hamka. But in Malaysia, I would like uh, the younger generation to know about him, uh, to read uh, his works and be inspired by his principles. And I will talk about those things later, inshallah, in the series, because these are wonderful principles uh, which uh, were exemplified in the personality of Buya Hamka, a very rare personality, but a personality that is uh, uh, exemplary. And that makes uh, Buya Hamka really an icon of Islamic reformism with, uh, with Islamic spirituality at the core of his personality, his thought, and his mission. Again, this is also very rare because usually uh, you find among uh, Muslim reformists a certain uh, intellectual aversion to tasawwuf, uh, particularly uh, in some parts of the Arab world. Uh, but in the Malay world, it is common uh, to, to understand that uh, Muslim scholars could be experts in many areas, but they would also be uh, interested uh, and might even be practicing some uh, aspects of, of, of tasawwuf um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, uh, in Malay culture. And this is because uh, for, the, for the benefit of our brothers and sisters outside of the Malay world, we have a sister from Turkey, Japan, and so on. They should know that one of the great um, characteristics of Islam in the Malay world is that, uh, that tasawwuf, Islamic spirituality, is integrated uh, with a fiqh, with uh, kalam, with ilmu uh, tawheed, uh, and um, with, uh, um, with religious, other religious sciences. And in fact, a tasawuf uh, becomes the, the core discipline uh, within this Islamic uh, integration of knowledge. Now, this is uh, actually the legacy of uh, the great Imam Al-Ghazali, the great Sunni Al-Ghazali, the great Mujaddid uh, and, uh, of, the of the fifth uh, century Hijriya, and also um, um, the, uh, the great, um, you might say, uh, reviver of, of, uh, of the integrated um, tradition of Islam. Uh, before Al-Ghazali, the religious sciences were um, fragmented into uh, fiqh as one uh, independent discipline, uh, philosophy, and then uh, theology or ilm al-tawheed, and then you have also tasawuf, all, uh, all, all uh, divorced from one another and claiming to be the, the better discipline uh, as compared to others. But Imam al-Ghazali brought them all together once again, as, as it used to be during the time of, uh, of the Sahaba and in the first uh, century of, of Islam after the demise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So um, I would like um, our, our, our brothers, the younger generation, uh, to again be uh, inspired by this uh, great um, uh, Malay uh, scholar. Now, um, I mentioned about his uh, Tasawuf modern, uh, and can you imagine that he wrote this in 1938-39? Where were you uh, around this time? Uh, 
uh, your parents might not even be uh, married. <laughs> but uh, he wrote this and he called it the South Modern. I was puzzled. How come you use the South Modern? I'm sure some of those followers of the South might object to the idea. Is there a modern Sufism? You know, because um, they think that there is already Sufism as such and you don't need to call it modern or classical or what have you. But Buya Hamka explained that what he meant by modern, you know, in his uh, introduction to uh, the South modern, he said, uh, of course, the South meant, uh, you know, the, the, the spiritual tradition of the Quran and the Sunnah exemplified by the spiritual life of the Prophet وسلم, and the great companions. And modern to him meant that the authentic teachings of the South from the Quran and the Sunnah uh, are brought to bear on modern times to make them relevant to modern times uh, and, and then he call it modern so it's not that Sufism became modern but that the the uh, spiritual teachings and values of the Quran and the Sunnah were brought to bear uh, upon the challenges of today's world and this is a great contribution and it is for this reason that I want to uh, speak more about this spiritual dimension of his thought and his personality because I am uh, very, very disappointed, um, disillusioned uh, with the political chaos uh, in my country uh, and also the, um, uh, the egoistic uh, tendencies of political leaders, self-serving culture of, of uh, some of these uh, political leaders and political elites, and also the uh, uh, the um, the upper class and the Malay middle class professionals uh, pursuing materialistic goals in life and and forgetting uh, al akhirah forgetting uh, the end, forgetting the sa'a, forgetting the day of judgment, and forgetting uh, the the most important. Uh, aspect of uh, spiritual communication with Allah on a on, on a daily and constant basis, and and this uh, when we study Buya Hamka, we will see that uh, that Buya's um, uniqueness uh, is in fact due to the fact that he is inspired uh, um, uh, deeply by the spiritual tradition uh, of the Quran and the Sunnah, and this is what we need to. Uh, uh, to uh, to to revive, we need to bring back to life uh, this uh, spiritual dimension of uh, of of uh, of contemporary politics, of contemporary uh, economy, of contemporary culture, of contemporary education, uh, and um, contemporary um, um, international relations. Uh, and I guess um, now that the world is also facing this pandemic uh, due to COVID-19, plus also the climate emergencies and many other uh, emergencies uh, enveloping this, uh, this wretched earth, uh, all the more reason why we need to return to the uh, life-saving uh, norms and values of uh, uh, of Quranic and Sunnatic spirituality, which uh, Buya uh, called uh, uh, Tasawuf modern. All right, um, I guess uh, that is uh, that should be uh, enough for the uh, uh, for my justification for for uh, wanting to speak about Buya uh, at at at, uh, at this age of seventy eight. Uh, uh, I do hope that others, inshallah, will revive uh, and uh, uh, bring back to life uh, the important contributions of, uh, of Buya and people like him uh, in Indonesia and also in the Malay world. Now, let me just uh, talk briefly about his early life. Uh, tonight, I may not be able to go into the spiritual um, dimension of his thought. Uh, but uh, some of our young people uh, may not know some of these facts about uh, Buya Hamka. I had the opportunity also to visit uh, his birthplace uh, and um, 
near in, in Maninjao in um, West Sumatra um, uh, many, many years ago and, and visited his, his house. And um, okay, uh, uh, Hamka is his pen name. Uh, of course, the older generation, they know this, but his uh, original name was uh, Abdul Malik bin uh, Abdul Karim Amrullah. And um, later on, Haji Abdul Malik uh, uh, Karim Amrullah. And then uh, he was uh, conferred the um, honorary uh, doctorate by Al Azhar University in 1959. And so um, he attached uh, DR to his name, Dr. Haji Abdul Malik uh, Karim Amrullah. And even to, uh, his his, his father, uh, you may not know, was the first uh, Indonesian, uh, among the first few Indonesians to be conferred the honorary doctorate by Al-Azhar uh, several years before the son uh, got his uh, honorary doctorate. Uh, so uh, Haji Rasul or uh, Haji uh, Abdul Malik uh, uh, Abdul Karim Amrullah was also conferred uh, the honorary doctorate by Al-Azhar, uh, the first Indonesian uh, to be conferred by Al Azhar, uh, the doctorate. So sometimes uh, he would write Dr. Haji Abdul Malik uh, Karim, uh, or Haji Abdul Malik uh, Haji uh, Dr. Um, Abdul Karim Amrullah. Of course, he wrote uh, the uh, biography of his father, Ayahku, and his children also wrote uh, his biography uh, with, um, uh, you know, Ayah. Uh, with our one of the sons uh, of uh, Buya Hamka wrote um, a, a biography of his uh, of his wonderful father. Uh, so Buya came from a a very religious uh, family uh, of um, of Minangkabau, but uh, religious, but also in a way uh, pluralistic, because um, at that time uh, Minangkabau was. Uh, was in the throes of uh, a conflict between the proponents of the old conservative tradition of Islam, which accommodated uh, the pre-Islamic uh, uh, customs of of uh, of, of, of Minangkabau, uh, and then you have the uh, the advent of of Islamic reformism brought by his father, um, who was influenced uh, at that time in Mecca. Uh, by another reformist Indonesian scholar uh, and uh, who also got uh, the influence from the reformist uh, movements in Egypt, which was led uh, first by um, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu and then followed later on by his uh, great disciple, uh, Sheikh, uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Rashid Abdul Rashid Rida. And um, the writings of uh, Rashid Rida in Al Urwatul Wuthqa uh, also were brought to the Malay world, to, uh, to Singapore and Penang during British Malaya, and then crossed the Straits to Minangkabau. Uh, so uh, Minangkabau uh, was exposed to this reformist Islamic thought, which uh, had its origins in. Uh, in Egypt uh, uh, at the hands of, of Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Rida. Uh, so his father was, was actually the pioneer of Islamic reformism, but his father was a very stern, serious man, uh, highly respected, but also feared uh, by his opponents. But he, uh, he always took his ground and he would not give in uh, to the, uh, to the you know, un-Islamic uh, um, uh, compromises that uh, conservative traditional uh, Minangkabau uh, Islam had been practicing. Uh, so, and, and they are called uh, Kaum Tua. So Kaum Muda versus Kaum Tua uh, was actually the scenario uh, in which um, uh, Buya Hamka was born into. So um, um, his father was uh, an opponent of, of, of Tariqah, but his grandfather, uh, his grandfather, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Amrullah, was actually a leader of the Naqshbandiya Tariqa uh, in in Minangkabau. So you have, uh, you know, uh, so Buya Hamka is in between his uh, his Puritanist, uh, fundamentalist, uh, reformist father 
and uh, um, a grandfather who is uh, a, a leader of the, you might say, um, uh, a tolerant tasawuf uh, and, and, and tariqa, Sufi, uh, Sunni tariqa, which is um, very widely practiced in this part of the world, that is Naqshabindiya and, and Al Qadiriya. So, um, so uh, very early and later on, coming from this background, Buya tried to bridge uh, the chasm between this uh, hardline reformism uh, and the uh, and uh, and the sort of uh, the tolerant uh, um, uh, Sufi uh, tradition, um, and then. Um, now, uh, remember, there, there was no Indonesia at that time. Uh, no Indonesia. Uh, Republic, uh, Republic Indonesia came into being, uh, you know, in, uh, well, of course, the declaration was 1945 by Bung Karno, but uh, the Dutch came back and they fought, and then finally there was uh, a general election in 1955. So the, the, uh, the Republic came into being uh, as a unitary state, and thanks to to the initiative of Mashumi, particularly uh, Pak Nasir, who who uh, promote, who came out with this uh, unitary state idea uh, of a single unitary republic called Indonesia, uh, and thanks to uh, Pak Nasir, um, we have this uh, nation, new nation uh, state called uh, uh, the Indonesian Republic. Otherwise. Uh, during the time of Buya Hamka, it was Dutch is in this. It was Dutch is in this because the Dutch uh, were the uh, were controlling uh, the political and economic life of uh, of the people in in uh, in Sumatra uh, and also in Java. Uh, of course, they they could not penetrate Aceh. Bismillah. Um, now, Buya was known uh, uh, as a quite a naughty, <laughs> naughty young boy. Uh, not really in the bad sense, uh, but you know, he, he was naughty and uh, and uh, difficult to 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 discipline him because he had his own ways of doing things, and uh, he was not happy with the uh, the formal classes in the primary school and also in the Sumatra Tawali school, uh, he would rather go to the library of his teacher and spend hours in the library uh, reading books. Now, Buya Hamka was a voracious reader and a prolific writer. Uh, this, again, this is, uh, you know, a very rare quality. And, and so you have 113 and, and maybe hundreds more of uh, of, of articles uh, in magazines and journals uh, and newspapers uh, and, and, and not not to mention the hundreds of of um, recorded uh, speeches on on cassettes uh, on radio cassettes uh, at that time uh, you can still hear some of these cassettes on on YouTube today uh, if you want to listen to the voice of Buya Hamka that caused a slow moving but eloquent and sincere voice of uh, Buya Hamka. You can listen to him and you can see him uh, on YouTube. Alhamdulillah. Now, um, now not happy with the uh, educational facilities uh, in, the, in, in Sumatra or in the Minangkabau at that time, he, um, uh, Prof Aslam, please let me know how much time I have, I do not want to exceed the time limit. Another five minutes. Okay, good. I will try to finish in five minutes. Um, okay, um, he was not happy. Now, being, being thirsty for knowledge, he knew that he came to know that Java uh, had a more uh, enlightened uh, way of, 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 um, of, of, uh, constructing uh, the knowledge of Islam. Uh, and so he was uh, really itching to travel to, to Java. Uh, of course, his father called him 
uh, I think his father gave him a nickname uh, as uh, si, uh, si Bujang Si Bujang Jao, the boy from afar, because he likes to be away from home. <laughs> he got his opportunity at the age of 16 to go to Java, to go to Jogja, because Jogja was the intellectual capital of Indonesia. So he went to Jogja and, and met these uh, leaders over there. He met Haji Omar, Said Chokro Aminoto. He met also Siba um, Aki uh, Bagus Hadikusomo and, and many others. These were the great intellectual leaders uh, and also the, um, um, you know, the great leaders of Muhammadiyah movement uh, in, in Jogja. But uh, then he went to Bandung. And in Bandung, he met uh, uh, also the great, um, another uh, eminent, uh, but uh, not well known, uh, was Ahmad Hassan, uh, a Singaporean who, who lived in, in, in Bandung uh, and um, was in a, way, in a way an intellectual teacher of, of, of Panasir also uh, in Persis. Um, and um, then he met also uh, Panasir and they became uh, great friends. Uh, in in um, in Mashumi, uh, and also in combating the ideology of socialism of 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 uh, Sukarno. Now, what I would like to uh, mention in the next few minutes is that um, he um, uh, he went to then he went to Pekalongan to be with Sultan Mansur. Another this is a very important source of. Uh, information of, of religious knowledge uh, and charisma on Buya Hamka and he never forgot what uh, his brother-in-law in fact uh, Sultan Mansur contributed to his uh, knowledge of Islam and the practice of Islam but what I want to uh, mention now is that um, after joining Mashumi and then to, um, uh, then uh, 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 participated in the political activities of Mashumi against uh, Sukarno's idea of Nasakom, that is a combination of nationalists, um, uh, religious, uh, religionists, and communism. Uh, Mashumi was against it and uh, criticized uh, um, Sukarno for that. And as a result, Sukarno imprisoned uh, uh, Mashumi leaders. Uh, so Buya Hamka um, uh, um, and um, and uh, what's his name uh, Patnasir and many others uh, were detained and imprisoned, and uh, it would have been much longer. But uh, in the case of Buya Hamka, uh, he spent uh, two years and four months uh, in the, in detention in in prison. And he did say, "This is really wonderful." And, and you know, again, you, this this reflects the, the spiritual quality of the man. He never complained about being detained. In fact, he was grateful for being detained. He said, "This is this is uh, the, the wisdom of Allah. Had I not been detained, first I would not be able to complete uh, the uh, Tafsir al Azhar. He, he thought he would need twenty years to complete it, but he completed Tafsir al Azhar in in two years and four months." Uh, and and then also uh, in in this um, uh, in this uh, during this imprisonment he was also uh, he he realized also that that Allah has has protected him from certain things by giving him certain supernatural uh, ways of protection uh, to him. Uh, so I, I have no time really to uh, to go into detail about this. But uh, when uh, when Suharto. Uh, with this uh, uh, 1966 uh, uh, movement to overthrow uh, Sukarno, uh, succeeded mm -hmm. in 1966. Uh, he was released just before, I think they were planning uh, drastic things against uh, Mashumi uh, mm -hmm. inmates, but by the grace of Allah, uh, the um, Suharto, uh, Lieutenant, Suharto, Lieutenant General Suharto at that time uh, managed to topple uh, the regime and the communist dominance of, of Suharto's dictatorship and, and as a result uh, Buya Hamka was released. So I'll stop there, I'll stop there and uh, inshallah hopefully uh, I would be able by the grace of Allah uh, to um, continue 
in the next, uh, inshallah, seven uh, series, next seven uh, Fridays uh, by the grace of Allah. So thank you very much. I, of course, look forward to um, learning more from, I'm sure there are many Indonesian brothers and scholars who can add much more. I stand to be corrected. I would like to be corrected. And uh, if you cannot um, uh, give your critical comments, you can, you can, you can send it to my, uh, you can what's up to me. And I think you, you can, uh, maybe Prof. Uh, Aslam can, can share my uh, telephone number uh, with them or my uh, email address. Maybe email address is better, Prof. Okay, so I'll stop there. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, wonderful uh, appetizer, I think, to the sessions to come uh, from next Friday onwards where you are going to be going into more detail uh, about the life and uh, thought of uh, Buya Hamka. Uh, we, we have a few um, uh, questions already, so let me go straight to them. Um, one, the first one is from Suadi Saad. When studying with the late Professor Harun Nasution, he always remind us, reminded us not to quote Hamka too much because his works, according to Prof. Harun, are popular, not scientific. This is an interesting point. Okay. What is your view? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. Very good. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, of course, um, uh, Dr. Harun Nasution belongs to a different uh, strand of Muslim thought. And this is, you might call the neo mutazilite strand of, uh, of uh, contemporary Islamic thought. And, uh, and Harun Nasution never uh, apologized uh, for propagating the views of the Mu'tazila uh, in, in Indonesia. Uh, and he defended the rationalism of the Mu'tazila. This is actually going against uh, the Islamic orthodoxy in, 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 the, in the Sunni theology. Uh, and not to quote Hamka, uh, it depends on what you are really looking for. If you're looking for um, a very rigorous uh, kind of uh, scientific research on history, uh, maybe you do not find it in, in, in Buya's works on history. Or if you are looking at rigorous um, uh, you know, a comparative study of the Sawuf um, based on manuscripts, you will not find that because I, I have not really uh, seen Buya referring to any, uh, let's say, manuscripts because he was not living in London or, uh, or in Germany or in France, uh, which had all the uh, important manuscripts on the Sawuf. Remember that, you know, uh, the French Orientalists uh, uh, had, um, you know, great um, contribution on the history of the uh in, in 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 France and also in in England. You have uh, several Orientalists in Germany, and and they would refer to the original manuscripts. Uh, and Buya, uh, for the most time, would refer to uh, Al Junaid, Al Khushairi, which are all already published works. Uh, even uh, the critique on, on Tasawuf written by, um, by a great uh, scholar, I cannot remember his name now, but inshallah in future I will remember this, um, a great uh, Azhari scholar. Um, okay, uh, my battery, uh, battery is running low. Okay, um, I'm telling uh, Shah, Shahzan that the battery is running low. Uh, okay, so... Um, Yes, um, uh, he was popular. Yes, but um, you you find uh, I would I would uh, go to a, a popular discourse which is authentic uh, and sincere and having a, a, a far more transformative value than going to a very uh, let's say uh, scholarly academic discourse uh, written by a a rationalist, um, a, a neo-rationalist, um, and, and uh, uh, which in a way distorted the uh, authenticity of Islamic theology. Uh, so um, I, I still maintain that we should quote uh, from Buyaham, especially his uh, wise words. He had many 
uh, wise uh, words, philosophical uh, wor words from Buya Hamka, which came from the heart, not from the mind of a Mu'tazilite, of a new Mu'tazilite. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, for your information, we have 281 participants at the moment. And I think another 50 or 60 on Facebook. Uh, we have a we have a question from Nuruddin. Sorry, um, Nuruddin. Uh, can Hamka be positioned as one of the figures who developed the idea of Islamization of knowledge in the Malay world, especially in the field of historical writing uh, against Orientalist narratives and the mm -hmm. development of literary writing based on Islamic spirit? Uh, against secular and communist tendencies. Oh, okay, that's very good. I, I never thought that, that there would be such a question. Uh, but this is a very important question because, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, trends of contemporary Islamic thought is this uh, uh, serious critique of westernization, secularization, and de Islamization in the Muslim world. And this led to the uh, to the movement of uh, Islamization of knowledge or Islamization of human knowledge that we popularize in IIUM. Um, Buya Hamka, uh, I think um, uh, he, was, he was full of praise for the scientific technological uh, achievements of the West, uh, just as Muhammad Abdu uh, also uh, having that kind of uh, positive evaluation and I don't blame them because at that time uh, you you are looking at the peak of, of, of European science not the corruption of European science that we saw in the late 20th century and now in the 21st century uh, the the uh, the the, um, uh, the crisis of, of modern science is is felt uh, in the 21st century not in the uh, in the middle of the 20th century, so they 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 did not, uh, uh, you know, um, see that. But um, but they 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 witnessed, uh, of course, the Second World War, uh, and 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 Iqbal was the one who uh, who uh, said that uh, modern Western science should be Islamized. He did not use the word Islamized, but uh, uh, you know he gave uh, he used the metaphor of of Al Karrar. Karari Sayyidina Ali he said uh, Abu Lahab has to be has to be transformed into Sayyidina Ali. Uh, otherwise, uh, Western science is is like Abu Lahab, uh, representing uh, jahiliyyah, uh, ignorance and arrogance. Uh, so Buya did not really uh, broach the subject of Islamization in that way. But when he talked, when he his look at his writings, his uh, literary works. His, uh, his novels, his novels are generally didactic, whereas today's novels are, are actually, uh, you know, breathing uh, the spirit of postmodernity, of nihilism, of relativism, you know, of existentialism, uh, or uh, in the 60s of, of, social, uh, of, of uh, socialistic realism. Uh, but uh, today, uh, you don't talk about socialistic uh, realism, or, or, but you, you would uh, try to, to reflect the spirit of postmodernity. But Buya, in his novels, had uh, a religious message. And some of the novels, like Si Sabaria, were, were based on actual historical uh, figures. Uh, and then his travelogues, he had about four travelogues. Uh, and you can, his critique of, of the American uh, moral uh, uh, decadence, uh, that reminds me of, of, uh, of, of Sayyid Qutub, who went to America and also came back with a critique of the modern American uh, moral decadence. And Buya was, 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 was concerned about the moral decadence, but appreciated the scientific advancement. But it's only now, because during Buya's time, we did not have postmodernity. Mm -hmm. And it is thanks to postmodernist uh, philosophy of the French and later on of, uh, followed by the American postmodernism, which exposed the connection between knowledge production and knowledge construction with the, uh, with the sustenance, sus sustainability of colonial power. So power and knowledge were intertwined. 
uh, even scientifically. And this was uh, revealed to us not by Muslim uh, fundamentalists, but by French philosophers. Um, you have uh, Feyre Band and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, those uh, postmodernists who expose uh, this kind of, uh, and, and that is in the late 70s and 80s. So Bouya, and since Bouya doesn't read English or French, uh, Bouya is not exposed to postmodernist critique of modernity. Uh, and neither was he uh, exposed to, um, to the, uh, let's say, the works of, um, of Thomas Kuhn with his uh, The Structure of, uh, of Scientific Revolutions in 1962. Uh, this was a, a major breakthrough uh, which showed that science developed not linear, linearly, but, uh, uh, but actually uh, by uh, paradigm shifts. Uh, as, 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 as dictated by the community of scientists at a particular time and space. Uh, so science is very, very subjective. Uh, so science is socially constructed. Now this, this kind of, of, of uh, discourse is found in the IOHK, which of course uh, Professor Naqib al attas initiated with, uh, with uh, Ismail Farouki, Said Hossein Nasser, Osman Bakar, uh, Muzaffar uh, Iqbal, and many others, including also Ziauddin Sardar, you know, address these issues, uh, that this, this, uh, uh, the, um, the crisis of modern science, uh, which uh, uh, unfortunately Buya Hamka was not actually exposed to. But his literary works can be seen as a way of uh, retaining the spiritual, moral uh, purpose of creative writing. Thank you okay. very much, Prof. Um, All right. We have some questions which may be more uh, relevant for your future sessions. I, I'll read them and, okay. and you can. Uh, could you please, please give some example on, of modern tasawwuf that had been introduced by Prof. Hamka? Okay. But maybe this question is something that is relevant okay. today. The okay. reformist challenge is basically the traditionalist group. From your Sorry? opinion, what is the best method to improve? the positive perception towards the reformist. Uh -huh, okay, maybe that one I can, uh, the second one I can briefly uh, respond. Um, well, I guess uh, one of the problems is also the way the reformist uh, uh, discourse is interpreted uh, by, um, by, by, by our own people and also by the Western scholars. For instance, the reformist movement in Indonesia uh, Dilia Noor calls the the modernist movement. Uh, I'm not too happy with this, uh, with with the labeling of uh, of tajdid and islah movement in Indonesia as modernist. Uh, but I know that uh, scholars of of, of Muhammad Abdul uh, have also uh, decided to call him a modernist. Uh, I would still prefer to talk uh, of uh, of uh, Muhammad Abdul as a reformist. Uh, and not as a modernist in the sense of one who supports the, the philosophy of modernism uh, in which uh, religion would eventually fade away if you follow Auguste Kohn's three stages of, of social development from the metaphysical to the positive, uh, you know. Uh, so um, 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 I, I don't want to call uh, the... Um, uh, people like, uh, uh, you know, people like uh, the father of Buya Hamka as a modernist. No way. Uh, he was a reformist. Uh, he appreciated the thoughts of, of uh, Abdu and all that, uh, and also science. But, um, but what they wanted actually was, was modernization of technology, modernization of technique, uh, using the, the French word of technique, uh, modernization of technique. Uh, uh, so, um, a, a modernization of, of facilities of education, instead of sitting on the floor, you want to have students sit on chairs and tables and, and you have blackboards, at that time blackboard, now you have whiteboard. This is part of this uh, modernization, but not modernism. So, I, I would refrain from using uh, uh, this, um, you know, calling the reformist challenge uh, the reformist uh, trend as modernist. So that is one way to, 
to, uh, to, to improve the perception, the, to give a positive perception to the, um, uh, to the uh, reformist uh, trends in, in contemporary uh, Islam. Okay, Prof, we have a few more questions, but um, I think there are a few questions by uh, Rabia from Turkey, which I think you really need to deal separately because it's one, two, three, four, you know, so oh, very detailed discussion okay. about... Especially could, could you ask her to, to email me, please? <laughs> Inshallah. Uh, okay. Dealing especially with uh, Tafsir al-Azhar. Um, but there is a general question which maybe you could, you could answer here. How, how could Hamka write such a complete tafsir while in the prison? How okay. did he get all the references? Oh, okay, good. Okay, actually, uh, he completed, uh, you know, um, the, uh, the writing of tafsir uh, within that two years. But the, the, write, the writing of, uh, uh, of uh, tafsir as I was initiated um, uh, from, I think, 1958. Uh, he started his uh, morning lectures at uh, Masjid al uh, uh, al Azhar after after subo. He would be giving uh, kulia subo, and uh, he would start, um, you know, his his tafsir. And then the, his children and and uh, people uh, they took down or recorded, and then they wrote. And then later on, uh, he um, serialized some of this in. In, uh, in Panji Masharaka, and then decided to, uh, to you know, to, 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 to compile it. Uh, then, uh, uh, then in the prison, he, he finalized, uh, not that he, uh, he did everything in two uh, years and four months. Yeah. Uh, just, sorry, that question was from Nor, Nor Azza. And the earlier one was from Nurul Balkis. Um, as I said, Rabia has got a very detailed question. Uh, there is this one question from this very familiar name, uh, Shahran Kaseb. He <laughs> 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 says, okay. Prof, can you enlighten <laughs> us on Hamka and the Japanese occupation? Uh, oh. I saw his video as a Japanese school teacher. So uh, this is news to me. Okay. Maybe. I, I, I have to do more read. I have not really done... Uh, much reading on that, on that, yeah, I, I, I cannot answer that, but I'm sure many of our brothers in Indonesia can, can, can respond because I've not read everything. I, I've been selective in my reading of Hamkas, you know, 113 works. I have to be selective. So I, I am more interested in his uh, spiritual writings. Prof, Prof Kamal, for your information, uh, Prof Karudia Aljunaid also joining us. Oh, <laughs> oh, mashallah, he is the authority. He should be able to answer. He should be able to answer. Uh, he and, knows uh, much more. He has all the information. He should be able to answer. Maybe you could ask him to, to respond, please. I think he also has a, he has a response. Maybe uh, if uh, Dr. Khairuddin would like to unmute and, and make yeah, your... Please, uh, Dr. Khairuddin, please join us. Yeah, please. Yeah, he is, he is. Yeah, bro. Yes, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh -huh. Oh, good to see you. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit underdressed. I just came back from uh, soccer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, Prof, I, I wish to thank you a lot for having this session and future sessions. Uh, we need to... Um, you should be doing this, <laughs> not me. No, no, you're, you're the best person to, uh, to give these talks. Because, no, uh, as I said, I, I selected a few things only, but you did everything. <laughs> yeah, and, and because you met Hamka personally, and that, okay. that is, uh, to me, uh, the most amazing thing that can happen to anyone, actually. Uh, I spoke to Professor James Rush, uh -huh. uh, who spoke to Hamka also personally a few times. Okay. And then he said that, you know, he was very much uh, captivated by how Hamka speaks, and uh, deliver many of his lecture, uh, lectures. But I, I just want to, to respond to one of the questions just now. And uh, this has always been an issue that many scholars have uh, with Hamka, uh, both as a person and as a writer of uh, 118 books. And 118, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And uh, many scholars have said that uh, Hamka is, is not an ulama or not an alim, uh, because many of his works 
uh, very informal and in many ways uh, unscholarly. Okay. And I think this has to do with the fact that uh, we view uh, scholarly writings mm -hmm. in the manner in which the West view scholarly writings. Okay, good. Is that uh, it has to be first mm -hmm. uh, formalistic. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to follow a certain formal way of presenting ideas. Okay. Uh, secondly, it has to be overly structured. So all of us are trained to write masters and PhD theses. You need to have an introduction. You need to have your terminologies right. You need to mm -hmm. have a methodology. Yeah. And then you present your ideas. And this is also a hallmark of modern Islamic scholarship. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But if we go back to the history of Islam and you read the book of the books of people like uh, Ibn Arabi, for example, Futuhat mm -hmm. al-Makiyya, mm -hmm. uh, if you read the book of Ibn Qayyim al jawziya and so many authors in the past, mm -hmm. uh, even recent ones like Hamza Fansuri, Mm -hmm. uh, in Arniri, all these formal formalisms that we see now do not actually exist in the history of Islam. And Hamka placed himself within that genealogy of knowledge that was there. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where when we read Hamka, I, I had a problem reading Hamka really as someone who's uh, very much trained in, in the formal master's mm -hmm. PhD mode. Uh, I had a big problem I spent three months in Brunei trying to understand him properly. Mm -hmm. And then there was this Dutch scholar whose name is uh, Hank Meyer. I think some of you may know him, who studies Indonesian literature because I was asking him a simple question. Uh, what is Hamka's methodology? He doesn't have a methodology. Mm -hmm. And his answer to me was Hamka's methodology is Hamka. You have to read him with his style. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, as all of us are trying to appreciate his works, we mm -hmm. need to understand that uh, the Islamic scholarly tradition uh, do not necessarily follow the Western formalistic uh, scholarly tradition. Hamka wrote in a manner that the Indonesians, the Malays during his time could identify with, which is to start with a story, uh, to give analogies. So that's why when we read Tafsir al-Azhar, we are surprised to see him citing a lot of scientific works and then citing a novel and then citing a poem. He goes in all directions because his main point is to impress upon people certain messages that could reform the way in which uh, they think. So just, just that point. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. I just want to add here, uh, if you look at um, a, a, you know, a scholar like uh, Anawawi, you know, we all know uh, Nawawi. He died, uh, what, uh, um, at what, 45 or 50? Um, he, he doesn't have a bibliography and um, all that kind of methodology. But go to the Quran uh, to, to, to look at how Allah defines a scholar. Uh, and then you find that uh, Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Closing the ayah, in which uh, Allah talks about, you know, uh, natural phenomena of, of different colors of black and red and uh, uh, geological structures. Uh, and then at the end, كذلك, and then إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء, uh, meaning that only uh, my, uh, uh, the scholars uh, have the, uh, the fear of Allah. Uh, because through scholarship in Islam, uh, the alim is the one who, uh, who, who looks at the, the signs of Allah in the universe and then knows the power behind that, those signs as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore submits to Allah with, with awe, with, with, with khashya, and not just taqwa, but khashya uh, is a higher degree of, of taqwa. Uh, and, 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 and scholars are called um, uh, Scholars are the inheritors of prophets, uh, not of corporate giants, not servants of, of corporations or political parties, uh, or the uh, fund, uh, uh, those who provide the, the funding for research. But they are, uh, you know, inheritors of, of the mission of prophet. So, uh, as you rightly said, uh, we have to evaluate uh, the value of an Islamic scholar by using the, the Islamic criteria of, of evaluation, which is from the Quran and the Sunnah. 
uh, the Prophet himself is ummi, is unlettered. Uh, but who will not uh, consider the Prophet as the teacher of all teachers? Uh, anyway, so um, I think we need to, um, uh, to address that issue so that we can um, maintain the authentic Islamic uh, 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 criteria, the furqan uh, that, uh, that the Quran provides and not be deceived by the ghurur, the deception of Western uh, hypocritical scholarship. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, you know, if I, can, if I can get a gist also of what uh, Dr. Hairuddin was trying to say, uh, I think, you know, what we have today in our, mm -hmm. in our academic world is sometimes uh, we tend to write material using jargon and terminology in such a way that only our own narrow disciplined people can understand. Yeah, and, and probably this was not what Hamka uh, did in his writing. He made his writing accessible to maybe anyone who could, you know, appreciate different areas. And, exactly. and that maybe is what it's all about. In fact, he about. did say this, uh, Prof. Aslam, he yeah. did say this in his uh, long introduction to Tafsir al-Azhar. He said, uh, you know, I have to write it in this way because I am thinking in front of me, you have army generals, you have professional businessmen, workers. So I have to find a, a level of discourse which could be, uh, you know, acceptable to everybody. Okay. I really wish that we could, you know, stop time and, and continue to have the discussion, but it's now 10 minutes past 10 and and I, you, you, this is the first of another six sessions to come uh, next Friday at 9 p.m. I really hope, uh, you know, everyone will try to make it again where I think the discussion will go a little bit more detailed into different phases of, of Hamka's life and also his thought. Uh, there are a few more questions which were not answered, but as mentioned by Brother Shahran, we will make sure that these questions are conveyed to you, to Prof. Kamal, uh, to either answer directly and we will also make your email inshallah uh, available to those who are here uh, just to mention to others uh, Farid Faiz asks about Prof's observation on the continuation of Hamka's stance and approaches after his passing away um, and then uh, uh, Munawar Saleh uh, uh, asks why did Sukarno want Buya Hamka as the Imam when he passed away this is apparently in his testimony um, and then uh, Nuruddin answers, and I think this is a wonderful place to to end. Uh, Nuruddin answers, Brother Shahran. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, Hamka has written his own story in the Japanese period, in the book Kenang Kenangan Hidup. Okay. Memories of life. So, so yeah, yeah. I, I have. I bought this book Kenang Kenangan Hidup, but I don't have the time to read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> because it's so thick. I think it's about 600 pages. Wow. Okay. I'm sure Dr. Kharuddin must have read. Yeah. All right, Prof. So with, with this, we've come to the end. Um, I, I wonder maybe uh, if Prof. Auzan has any, any uh, comments? Yes, for, yes, for your information, Prof. We, we reached 282 participants from Nigeria, Germany, Turkey, South Korea, and of course Malaysia and Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka, all over the world. Mashallah. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to see you next week. Uh, and Prof. Khairuddin, please uh, join us next week, 9 o'clock, Malaysian time. Prof. Aslam. Prof. Khairuddin to speak next time, Mashallah. <laughs> 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 Thank but, you very uh, much. Wonderful book, uh, Prof. Khairuddin. Your, your book, Hamka and Islam, is really wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, we've come to the end and uh, I thank everybody. I apologize for any shortcomings on, on my part. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again uh, next week. Uh, I pass it back to uh, Brother Shahran if you have any last comment about next week's session. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Islam. Thank you, Prof. Uh, we will upload uh, the, the, the lecture in our YouTube channel, in our Facebook, inshallah, and we all keep in touch. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
dari pada bulan Ogos. Bulan Perkesu. Ha, ha, yang 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 pas yang yang apa ni uh, subsidi upah yang diumumkan oleh kerajaan hanya untuk pekerja di bidang pelancongan dan peruncitan. Sedangkan uh, laporan Perkesu pada bulan Ogos yang lepas menyatakan bahawa mereka yang terjejas <coughs> mereka yang terjejas Uh, pekerjaannya oleh mereka yang berada di sektor perkilangan industri sekitar 24%. Sekitar 24%. Yang terlibat dengan uh, sektor penginapan, makanan dan minuman sebanyak 15%. Jadi uh, adakah uh, bajet kita ini, belanjawan kita ini dihalakan kepada kumpulan sasaran yang betul? Uh, jadi itulah. Uh, sekali lagi saya menegaskan bahawa uh, Belanjawan kali ini adalah belanjawan yang mengelirukan. Jadi untuk menjawab persoalan yang ditimbulkan oleh Pak Ya tadi, adakah ia memberikan uh, kesan yang baik kepada uh, masyarakat ataupun kepada rakyat, maka saya kira saya berada dalam kedudukan yang keliru, maka saya tangguhkan dululah untuk memberikan jawapannya. Terima kasih. Tengok ini, ramai yeah. dekat FB ni dia, 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 dia buat bantahan, dia kata Ini tak haji ni, moderator pun terpaksa jawab soalan daripada panel Waktu panel yang jawab, dia kata, dia orang kata bantah tentang ni Panel bagus jawab, tapi panel tanya dekat moderator ni, dia kata tak patut Dia kata, ha, dia boleh boleh fall, boleh kena 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 apa nama kad merah <laughs> Okey, terima kasih banyak Encik Cikgu Midi Saya ingat pandangan okay, dan juga kepasan ini cukup menarik Daripada dia di uh, soal yang akhir itu Soal yang akhir kita masuk kepada rumusan Saya nak bersihkan sekali lagi Yang uh, berhormat uh, Serator Dr. Yaakob Sapari uh, Rumuskan daripada perbincangan kita Yang boleh jadi panduan uh, kepada rakyat Boleh panduan kepada pelisa Ada ramai yang mengikuti Ada juga ada pelajar-pelajar ni uh, YB Serator dan mereka yang belajar daripada dalam bidang ekonomi, dalam bidang perekaunan, dalam bidang bisnis yang nak dengar juga kupasan-kupasan yang lain daripada selain daripada pencara-pencara mereka. Silakan uh, YB Serator rumusan pembincangan kita pada malam ini. Okey uh, Pak Yah, terima kasih banyak. Uh, apa yang kita harapkan ialah dalam keadaan ekonomi jatuh begini, sepatutnya sektor kerajaan, uh, kerajaan yang membantu untuk menggerakkan ekonomi, khususnya menggerakkan ekonomi domestik. Satu kuasa beli domestik kena dikembangkan. Uh, tapi setiap malanya uh, apa ni, pendapatan telah menurun. Jadi kuasa beli menjadi semakin kecil. Satu uh, saya kira sekat uh, semua prihatin 350, 500, 700 ia tidak mampu untuk menggerakkan keseluruhan ekonomi dengan mencairkan uh, simpanan uh, EPF. Ini satu usaha kita mencairkan simpanan supaya dibelanjakan. Ketika ini kita galakkan rakyat berbelanja. Jangan menyimpan supaya ekonomi dapat berkembang. Um, jadi kepada saya mencadangkan apa mereka yang ada kelebihan dalam kewangan, waktu inilah kita masanya kita nak tolong kawan-kawan kita yang susah. Sebab uh, bagi orang susah, RM50 itu cukup belanja untuk sebulan atau RM100 cukup untuk sebulan. Tapi mungkin bagi orang kaya, ia hanya sekadar pengpiza sahaja. Dan itu saya merayu kepada mereka yang ada kelebihan agar dibantu kepada kawan-kawan yang lain. Sebab kita yakin dengan hadis Nabi, tidak sempurna iman kita. Saat kita tidur lena kenyang, ada jalan kita yang lapar. Jadi mereka yang ada kelebihan, kena hulurkan. Banyak NGO-NGO di sana yang berperanan untuk membantu golongan-golongan yang susah ini. Sekurang-kurangnya untuk bantuan makanan. Bercakap soal EPF, orang kampung tak ada EPF. Jadi orang kampung ni uh, kena ditingkatkan pendapatannya supaya ada bantuan-bantuan di sektor pertanian untuk mengembangkan pendapatan mereka. Cuma Alhamdulillah waktu ini petani sawit saya rasa agak selesa kerana agak-agak baik. Mungkin boleh mengurangkan sikit Tapi bidang-bidang yang lain Masih perlu bantuan Jadi pada keseluruhannya Saya harapkan ekonomi ini Ialah untuk memacu ekonomi negeri Tetapi saya tak nampak jawapan Pada persoalan itu Saya mengikuti sepenuhnya Pemendangan bajet ketika di Dewan Parlimen Saya tinggal di Dewan Negara untuk melihat keseluruhan Saya tak nampak bajet ini Sebagai pemacu ekonomi waktu uh, ekonomi sedang berundung. Saya itu sebaik-baiknya kena ada semakkan kepada bajet atau dana khas. Setakat 100 bilion tidak cukup untuk pacu ekonomi dalam setahun. 
Kemudian yang saya sebut tadi, kena ada dana khas untuk membantu kontraktor umpamanya supaya kontraktor boleh survive dalam keadaan begini. Kemudian bantuan untuk penyayang kecil agar mereka boleh memudahkan mereka belanja. Ada nampak ada dana di AIM dan di Tukun. Kalau boleh dipermudahkan, diberi kepada penyayang kecil untuk mereka survive. Saya juga, uh, Cikgu Midi, uh, maklum antara terkesan ialah golongan Uh, M40, mereka yang berpendapatan wah 8,000 tapi agak terkesan sebab ada sebagian mereka telah kena berhenti kerja jadi tidak mudah dalam waktu yang singkat untuk mereka memulihkan ekonominya sebab itu kalau boleh penotorium diberi kepada mereka supaya tidak uh, dipaksa membayar hutang sebab mungkin ketika ini kalau gaji mereka sudah 8,000 ataupun 7,000, rumah mereka sekitar 2,000 dan kereta dan sebagainya dan biasanya kalau buat ini anak yang masih kecil lagi masih di bangku sekolah kata kena ada monitorium diberi kepada mereka agar beban membayar balik hutang dapat dilonggarkan sekarang ini ada monitorium baru pilih-pilih jadi kalau boleh diberi kepada perubahan ini sebab mereka juga terkesan kepada ekonomi jadi supaya lebih hanya ada boleh dimasuk dalam pasaran untuk mengembangkan apa ni ekonomi domestik. Uh, saya rasa uh, sektor-sektor lain juga walaupun di pelancongan sangat terkesan uh, apakah bantuan yang perlu diberi pada sektor pelancongan. Kalau kita lihat ada di Selangor Pak ya uh, kita punya GDP sumbang terbesar ialah daripada services. Tapi bila services terkesan langsung uh, ini memberi kesan langsung kepada ekonomi di negeri Selangor. Uh, industri sektor kedua, pertanian kecil sangat, sekitar 2% saja. Jadi uh, seperti uh, apa ni tourism yang memberi kesan langsung kepada pendapatan negeri. Yang ini sangat memberi kesan kepada uh, pendapatan negeri. Kemudian uh, juga uh, perumahan. Uh, kita rasa banyak lebih perumahan yang tak dijual atau mereka akan menjual rumah masing-masing. Jadi kerajaan kena pick up isu ini dan kalau boleh... Uh, Kerajaanlah yang kita tampil di hadapan dengan dana yang lebih besar. Saya rasa bajet yang ada hari ini sekitar 322.5 bilion dengan 236 itu hanya sekitar 84% untuk belanja mengurus. 60 bilion tidak mampu untuk menggerakkan ekonomi. Saya itu kena dana lain masuk sekitar 100 bilion atau 100 bilion untuk menggerakkan ekonomi yang ini perlu disediakan kerana boleh Uh, kita kena semak balik uh, pada peraturan-peraturan yang ada uh, Cuma Pak Ya pasal PKP ini Saya antara yang agak menegur pandangan saya pasal PKP ini Sebab uh, kawasan-kawasan yang tidak terkena langsung dengan apa ni wabak COVID ini Sepatutnya tidak tidak dikenakan sekatan Agar mereka bebas untuk bergerak Agar ekonomi boleh berkembang Contohnya kita boleh tahu zoning-zoning kawasan-kawasan yang terkena wabak yang ini boleh kita kawal. Tapi bila kita blok langsung pergerakan satu negara Malaysia, hmm. uh, pastinya ekonomi domestik akan menjadi jam. Sebab tidak boleh nak keluar ke negara-negara lain. Uh, dan itu juga kita kena lihat. Saya itu saya selepas tujuh bulan, saya melihat uh, melihat apa ni tidak petang, DG Kementerian uh, Kesihatan bentangkan, akhirnya patutnya kita sudah boleh lebih ke depan dalam penyelesaian masalah COVID-19 ini. Kalau kita hanya menggunakan keadaan yang sama, saya rasa ia kurang berkesan. Ya, terima kasih banyak pada Ida dan Pak Ia yang beri ruang kepada saya untuk bersama pada malam ini. Uh, mudah-mudahan uh, perbincangan saya dengan Cikgu Midi, dengan Pak Ia sangat berbaik sekali. Dan uh, tanya pada Ida yang terus berterusan untuk uh, memberi maklumat-maklumat kepada rakyat, pada khususnya uh, warga-warga cyber ini yang ber, kita bersama-sama di di Maya walaupun tinggal berjauhan di rumah masing-masing tapi kita disatukan dengan teknologi dan terima kasih banyak pada ide mudah-mudahan kita akan bertemu lagi di masa akan datang terima kasih banyak Pak Ya terima kasih banyak uh, Dr. Yanko Sapari dan uh, atas kupasan uh, poin-poin dan juga butiran hujah yang saya cukup, rasa cukup menarik yang boleh jadikan panduan untuk kita dan seluruh uh, jadi saya uh, kembali kepada Cikgu Midi untuk uh, rumusan kesuruhan, silakan Cikgu Midi ok terima kasih uh, sampai kepada rumusan ini maka uh, saya ingin uh, mengajak kepada semua 
uh, para penonton untuk melihat apa yang disebutkan dalam uh, surah Al-Quraj. Ya, surah Quraj itu apabila Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala untuk kita uh, meneliti kembali kebiasaan-kebiasaan orang Quraisy di ila fi Quraishin. Antara yang uh, ditekankan huraian apa yang menjadi kebiasaan selain daripada kepimpinan selain daripada pengurusan Mekah itu sendiri adalah tentang latihan uh, keusahawanan. Ya, kalau kita lihat balik bahawa Rasulullah SAW itu dilatih seawal usia 12 tahun mengikut uh, pak ciknya Abu Talib pergi ber, berniaga. Jadi uh, masuk kita boleh fahamlah dengan umur kita kat sini ni baru UPSR lah, okay, baru baru UPSR tapi telah pun didedahkan dengan uh, apa kata tu latihan keusahawanan. Jadi uh, kita perlu lihat balik eh, pendidikan kita pada hari ini supaya mereka ini memasuki lapangan perniagaan ini bukan sekadar teori tapi juga praktikal. Hmm. Uh, supaya kita tidak lagi uh, bergantung dengan cara hidup makan gaji ya, cara hidup makan gaji okay, selain daripada itu dalam surah yang sama juga yang disebut tentang dua perkara yang seharusnya menjadi perhatian kerajaan iaitu tentang uh, apa kata tu uh, khauf dan juak ini ya, khauf ini ketakutan, keselamatan ya, kita perlu ingat bahawa gelombang Okay, gelombang um, ketiga ini, okay, gelombang ketiga ini, salah satunya yang me- yang merebak di uh, Sabah, hmm, uh, apa ni, ketika hampir dengan apa sebelum pilihan raya negeri itu, ya adalah kebocoran uh, sempadan kita, dan kebocoran sempadan kita uh, kepada pendatang asing. Dan akhirnya mereka ini merebak dalam masyarakat dan apa uh, menghasilkan gelombang ketiga apabila hmm. uh, SOP tidak diikuti ketika kempen dilaksanakan ketika pilihan uh, raya umum peringkat negeri Sabah uh, dilaksanakan. Hmm. Hmm. Okey, itu uh, tentang uh, khauf dan juga tentang jok ini tentang kelaparan ini. Uh, tentang tentang kelaparan ini seharusnya kita memberi perhatian kepada uh, apa uh, perkara-perkara yang asas ya, yang asas dalam masyarakat ya mereka yang terkait dengan kelaparan ini adalah mereka dari golongan marhain ialah golongan marhain kelaparan ini <coughs> jangan kita lihat sebagai kelaparan fizikal saja tapi juga adalah kelaparan dari sudut pemikiran ya ilmu ya pendidikan seharusnya itu menjadi perhatian uh, pihak uh, kerajaan semua dan saya amat uh, apa kata tu amat uh, suka untuk menerima apabila ada ahli politik kita ya yang mengatakan bahawa tuntutan-tuntutan uh, ini adalah seumpama uh, tuntutan putri gunung ledang uh, terhadap sultan mahmud yang ingin memperistirikannya jadi saya ingin uh, menyatakan pandangan saya bahawa Sebelum dia uh, mempertikaikan tuntutan itu, seharusnya dia melihat tentang kerakusan nafsu Sultan Mahmud itu dulu. Uh, sebelum uh, Puteri Gunung Ledang. Kan, uh, Sultan Mahmud uh, pada dia tak ada masalah untuk keluarkan bajet membina jabatan emas dari istana uh, di Melaka ke Gunung Ledang. Kan, bukan sebab Melaka sebuah negeri yang kaya kan apa tah apalah sangat apa kata orang tu tujuh dulang hati nyamuk dengan tujuh dulang hati kuman akan dikerahkanlah seluruh uh, rakyat di Melaka itu untuk mencari hati kuman untuk mencari hati nyamuk cukupkan tujuh dulang tersetempayan air mata anak dara ha paksalah siksalah supaya mereka ini naik tetapi apabila sampai kepada syarat semangkuk ha darah Raja Muda, Tengku Mahkota bahawa inilah syarat yang tidak sanggup untuk dipenuhi ha, oleh uh, Sultan Mahmud Shah ketika itu. Jadi sebelum ya menuduh tentang tuntutan ini tidak masuk akal apa kata orang itu tidak munasabah seharusnya kita melihat dulu kerakusan contohnya dengan kita meletakkan bajet kepada jasa sebanyak 81.5 juta yang saya kira memang tak ada keperluan pada masa ini pun ya dan yang kedua kita tidak uh, mampu untuk berbincang dengan bank untuk mengurangkan uh, keuntungan bukan mengurangkan menangguhkan keuntungannya untuk tahun ini yang saya kira se- yang yang disebut sebanyak KK 30 bilion ringgit ya, di sektor perbankan jadi saya uh, nampaklah bahawa Rumusan saya kali ini, saya masih lagi berada dalam keadaan keliru.
Terima kasih. <laughs> Okey, terima kasih uh, banyak uh, yang berbahagia uh, Tuan Haji Abidi, Dato' Pengamanan yang merupakan uh, dekan uh, Haruan Pelajar di Universiti Selangor atau Unicel yang berhormat uh, Senator Dr. Yaakob Sapari yang kedua-duanya saya kira memberikan butiran, hujah dan juga diskusi yang cukup menarik bagi cikgu tadi uh, juga akhirnya dia kata kalau keliru kalau cikgu pun keliru anak murid lagi lah kan ha, jadi saya tu cuma saya 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 kira uh, uh, kita punya diskusi ini uh, uh, saya dapat pandangan banyak dia kata digunakan banyak juga untuk pelajar-pelajar yang uh, sekarang juga walaupun bukan mereka uh, main game saja kan ha, ada kata pelajar pun main game tapi tengok dia, dia mereka juga juga di saya rasa uh, boleh dimanfaatkan oleh mereka jadi uh, sekali lagi saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada kedua-dua ahli uh, panel yang telah uh, bersama-sama dengan Suraisan pada malam ini terima kasih sama-sama terima, terima kasih pada, kembali pak ya uh, terima kasih ya, kepada seluruh pengurusan Ya, ya. Sudah Raisan yang ditelajui oleh yang berbagai profesor Datuk Dr. Ridwan Usman uh, Teman-teman yang kru di studio Raisan yang terus bertugas untuk memastikan bahawa kelangsungan uh, sesi analisis uh, belajawan kita dilaksanakan pada setiap malam uh, hari ya, Terima ini kasih kita, kru uh, Kru-kru kita terima kasih banyak yang ada di studio, terima kasih banyak Terima kasih banyak kepada semua teman-teman yang mengikuti kita ya, ya, uh, pada ya, ya. setiap hari Teruskan besok kita ada lagi sesi, besok kita akan bersama dengan Profesor uh, Dr. Kamarul Azizi dan juga yang berhormat uh, Wong Chen uh, yang uh, saya kira banyak ditunggu-tunggu jujah daripada uh, YB Wong Chen daripada Ahli Parlimen Subang. Jadi teruskan sahabat-sahabat yang sudah asal pada malam esok untuk kita uh, hayati dan nikmati uh, hujah-hujah dalam analisis uh, belanjawan 2020. Terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Salam. Happy di Pabali. Ya, terlupa. Ibu berdali kepada seluruh uh, <laughs> Uh, Pengalaman Indo, Agama Indo, terima kasih. Uh, happy dia balik ni, dari bawah dia balik nak lawat ke? Lawat ke? Teman-teman di Tanjung Karang, uh, saudara Rawi, uh, semua yang ada di, di Tanjung Karang di seluruh negeri Selangor, seluruh uh, Malaysia ni happy dia balik pada isu hari. Terima kasih banyak. <tuh>